Nick. When Charlie slumps into my car at 3.15pm, I can tell something's up. I say hi, but all I get is a tiny grumble in response, and as soon as he shuts the door, he leans on the window and closes his eyes. I stay still for a moment, waiting to see if he's going to say anything, but he doesn't. You okay? Hmm, he says, unmoving. Bad day? Hmm. I drive off without pushing it. If he wants to talk about it, he will. That's the one thing I've learned about Charlie. If you try and make him talk about stuff he doesn't want to talk about, there's even less of a chance he'll eventually tell you. By the time we get to Charlie's house, he seems a bit better, so I don't bring it up. But something's still kind of off with him. He sits at his laptop in intense silence while I'm catching up with his mum. He spends at least half an hour choosing what to wear for Harry's party, even though he wears the same jeans and check shirts everywhere anyway. It takes him significantly longer than normal to eat dinner, which is always a sign he's stressed about something. In the car on the way to Harry's house, his knees bob up and down. Maybe he's pissed off at me for some reason. I have no idea why he would be. We park down the road and he walks a little way ahead of me and Tori, Charlie's sister, who we gave a lift to. Have you argued? Tori asks. Seems like he's pissed off with you. Not that I know of. I don't know what's wrong. Hmm. She doesn't say anything else. Harry Green lives in a townhouse near the high street. His massive parties are pretty much the main reason he's the most famous guy at Truham. We know that by 11, almost everyone will be in the basement dancing to some crappy dubstep remixes. By 12, people will be throwing up in houseplant pots and on the pavement outside. By 2, people will be asleep in corridors, breaking away into different rooms to mess around and getting high in the garden. Sure enough, Harry's got music blasting from the basement, making the floor vibrate, and there are people everywhere. Mostly Truham Six Formers, but definitely a few Year 10s and 11s too, and people from the secondary school across town. I think we were all supposed to be in the garden, but it started chucking it down with the rain. So much for summer. As soon as we're inside and Tori's gone off to find her friends, Charlie speed walks towards the kitchen for drinks. The kitchen table, as expected, is covered in bottles and plastic cups, and once we reach it, Charlie downs a vodka shot, and then another one. I think this might be the point where I need to actually say something. I touch his arm. Hey. He looks at me and takes a sip of the vodka lemonade he just made. Hmm? You okay? He nods a little too enthusiastically. Yeah, fine. Why? I shake my head. Uh, You just seem sort of on edge. He looks away again and pours a drop more vodka into his drink. Oh, just a bit stressed because of revision. Just been in a bad mood today. This seems like a reasonable explanation, I guess. Then again, Charlie could lie for Britain. He lies to loads of people. He lied to people at school for months about his anorexia. He lies to his parents sometimes when he wants to go out somewhere with me but isn't sure they'd let him. He lies to Mr Shannon to avoid becoming unpopular with other students. To be fair, he hardly ever lies to me, but occasionally I can tell that he's saying something just because he doesn't want to bother me. I think this might be one of those times. He takes another sip, his eyes dart around the room. Best coast, he says. What? The music? It's best coast. I hadn't even clocked that there was music playing in here. I try to think of something to say, but he beats me to it. We should get drunk. I chuckle. (laughs) I'm driving. Oh. You get drunk. I plan to. Do you think we should actually socialise first? He pours a glass of lemonade and hands it to me. Hmm, fine. He steps close to me. So close, I almost think he's going to go in for a kiss right here in front of the people chatting and drinking around us. But instead, he just gazes up at me beneath dark hair with icy eyes, smirking slightly the tease of a dimple in one cheek, letting loose everything that made me physically attracted to him in the first place. I'm half confused and half extremely flustered. Nick, he says, so low and quiet I probably wouldn't have heard it had I not been staring at his lips. I let out a nervous laugh, feeling my cheeks getting hot, but I don't really know what to say. We're not exactly averse to public displays of affection, but we're never like this when other people are around. What is he trying to do? I want a drunk hookup in the bathroom later, he murmurs, and then walks off before I have the chance to answer him.